right. Okay, uh, everybody. Uh, so we're gonna get started. I have to lean like this because uh, I don't see a microphone. Other microphone. Sorry about that. Um, now you get to see the ball spot on my head. <laughs> okay, so good evening. Welcome to the IMA public lecture. Um, the Institute for I, I, the IMA is the Institute for Mathematics and its Applications, and is the research center established by the National Science Foundation. The IMA develops new mathematics to solve problems arising in science, technology, and society, uh, and we are very pleased to sponsor tonight's lecture. Our speaker tonight is Professor Tadashi Tokieda. Dr. Tokieda received his undergraduate degree in mathematics from Oxford University. From there, he went to study mathematics at Princeton University. Uh, he received his PhD in, in 1996. His PhD studies were focused on a branch of mathematics called symplectic geometry. After his PhD, he focused his attention to problems arising in classical physics, fluid flow, dynamics. He currently is at the University of Cambridge, where he is the Kerner Fellow and Director of Studies in Mathematics at Trinity Hall. Dr. Tokieda has an unbounded curiosity and is fascinated by how you can take an object from daily life and make toys out of them. These toys are surprising in the way they behave, and he has made it his life's work to understand how they work. He was awarded the 2014 Halmas Ford Award for his paper entitled Roll Role Models, the Helmus Ford Award recognizes excellence in e expository articles published in the American Math Monthly. So please join me in welcoming Professor Tokieda. Around the world, billions of people drink from a cup every morning. And one day, one of us started tapping on the cup. We hear the same pitch, same note from all those four points. Maybe it is the characteristic pitch of this cup. You know, it's the same pitch from all those points. But then it occurred to me to tap somewhere else. Please listen. Those four points give a common pitch, but a higher pitch than before. What is going on? Huh? Thank you very much for pointing that out. Of course, it has to do with the handle. But if it has to do with the handle, wouldn't you have thought, as I thought the first time, that this half of the cup near the handle and this half of the cup farther from the handle should behave differently? But that's not how this symmetry is broken. Indeed, the point nearest the handle and the farthest from the handle behave exactly the same way, give you the same pitch, but 45 degrees off, you get a higher pitch. So this is a really strange phenomenon. Now, I'd like to try to understand what is going on. And here's what I came up with. You see, first of all, let's forget about the handle. Let's understand why any four points that form the vertex corners of a square behave always the same way and give you the same pitch. The fact of the matter is when you tap somewhere on the cup, you make that point vibrate like this. Well, in response, the opposite point can do one of the two things. Either it can do that, or it can respond this way. So the same way, opposite way. But the first response you see is just like moving the cup back and forth without changing its shape. And vibration, which is the cause of the sound, must involve the deformation of the body. You have to change the shape. So that's not participating in the production of sound. What is involved in the production of sound is this second response, this one. 
opposite way. But you see the cup doesn't want to change its volume, size, if it can help it. So when those two points come in, in order to save the volume, these two points go out, get pushed out, and when these go out, these two get pulled in. So that you get this kind of oscillation in a lozenge. That is why any four points that you might excite, it doesn't matter which one you tap, all the four points sing in unison. That allows us to understand why the same pitch in the first case and second pitch. But why on earth do those points give a low pitch and those four points give a high pitch? Well, in order to understand that, we have to revive the handle that we have been neglecting. You see, when those four points are excited, we already discovered that it doesn't matter which of the four points you tap, they all start singing in unison. They have to grab and drag the handle with them, you see, because it's attached to one of the points that's vibrating. On the other hand, do you remember those four points, 45 degrees off? When they vibrate, what happens is that this goes in, this goes out, this goes in, this goes out. Do you see what's happening in between? This point, to a good approximation, is not moving at all. It's called a node. So as far as those four points, 45 degrees off, are concerned, it's as if the handle is invisible. It's not there. So now you have two elastic systems. You can think of, as, of them as springs of the same stiffness, the cup vibrating. But one of the springs, in one case, is attached to a heavy, heavy weight. And the other one, that's the handle, the other one is not attached to anything. And when you let them go, what happens? Well, the heavy spring goes whoom, 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 whoom. And the light one goes hee-haw, hee-haw. And that's the difference of the pitch that we hear. That's really wonderful. Now, the inverse problem turns out to be quite interesting. Since we're talking about the pitch, let's talk about the pitch dark room. So far, we knew where the handle was, and we started figuring out what the sound pattern that came out of it was. But let's assume that we are in a pitch dark room, and we don't have no idea where the handle is. But we can go in, and suppose that we can tap around the cup, recording the sound pattern from each point. Given that sound pattern, can you reconstruct where the handle was? This is called the inverse problem because you are not solving the problem forward. Knowing the handle, what is the sound pattern? It's the backward. Given the observed data of the sound, can you sort of reconstruct a cause that is responsible for that observed data? And if you think about it, much of the scientific activity by humans is about solving one inverse problem or another. So it is a very, very important thing. And this very simple example of a cup shows us immediately that this inverse problem may not be always solvable. Indeed, you agree with me that it doesn't matter whether the, whether the handle is at this east, north, or west, or south, you would always get this same vibration pattern of the square, right? It's even worse. You can't tell where the handle is. You can't even tell the number of handles. Instead of having a large single handle, you could have two small handles on opposite each other, or four handles, even smaller, and they would give you the same sound pattern. So the Inverse problem is not in general solvable. It's a very, very curious and challenging situation. But up to symmetry, you can start saying something. You see, as soon as I noticed this uh, phenomenon several years ago, I started looking for a handle with, uh, sorry, cup with three handles, because that would break the symmetry in a very different way. So if you one day run across a cup with three handles, please let me know. That was about vibration and of a single uh, body. But now I would like to explore what happens if you increase the number of bodies that are interacting among themselves, those several things that talk to one another. Here is a soup bowl that I, I mean, borrowed from a canteen in Cambridge. And I brought the, here a box, which I don't know if you can read. It says Chai Gruzinski Extra, a Georgian extra quality tea, which I found on the street market. And inside there's another lid, which is probably too small to read on the screen. Kakzavrivaj Chai, how to brew a good cup of tea, and so on. Very scientific explanation. But that has nothing to do with the experiment that I'm going to show you. I'm just carrying around cedar balls inside. You know, the kind of balls that you put in your closet to repair the insects. Now, if I put some of those cedar balls, one thing that you can say about this experiment is that it smells nice. You can't say that about many other experiments. Um, if you put, say, two or three syllables, and then I swirl the cup, please watch what's happening. As I swirl, the balls circulate in the same direction that I'm swirling. Well, that's not surprising. You know, they respond to my swirling, and they circulate in the same direction. Now, 
let us increase the number of balls. I make them more crowded. And when I swirl, those balls start going in the opposite direction. Do you see that? I'm swirling this way, but the balls circulate in the opposite direction. So there was a transition. You see, with one ball, the circulation is the same direction as I'm swirling. Two, three, we saw it's the same direction. It's nothing wrong there. Four, it's still the same. At five, there's a lot of hesitation. They don't know which way to go. But at six and seven, there's a definite tendency to start going the other way around, and eight, and so forth. It is actually like a transition. We call it a phase transition between a gas and liquid in the sense of free, uh, sorry, condensing to, a gas condensing to liquid. And it is really like a phase transition in the sense that there's something here, not the temperature, but rather the crowdedness of the particles, those balls, that is making that transition. You see, it's a bit like very few balls. They don't talk to one another. They're just being bounced off the wall, so they just go in the same direction that I'm swirling. That's like gas, you know, independent particles. Whereas if you make them crowded, it's like liquid. You see, in a liquid, molecules are touching one another, but they can still slide past one another. But they interact. And what happens is that now, if a ball is hit off the wall, that momentum that is input is scattered among the neighbors, which are all in contact. But instead, what is not wasted is when the ball rubs against you, you start rolling in that direction, and that rolling or the spin is transmitted neighbors and so forth. So it is a transition from, if you like, a momentum-dominated regime to a rotation or angular momentum-dominated regime. And that's very much like a transition from gas to liquid. And to convince you that it is really like a phase transition of substances, if I keep increasing the crowdedness, then the whole thing freezes solid also. OK, that's it. Now, that's interesting to see a transition. Let's see another transition, which is a bit silly. So I'm slightly ashamed of showing this. Um, this is a nut and bolt, uh, fairly loose. And this is the cheapest electric toothbrush that I could find in Princeton. And when I switch on, it gets into action. Now, is it focused? I think it's focused. OK. Now, I'm going to push this against the, uh, the bolt. Well, it's going to make the whole thing vibrate. Yeah? But there's no reason why the bolt should uh, start spinning. Uh, sorry, nut should st start spinning one way or the other. It just um, vibrates. But if I focus my oriental energy into this, <laughs> I have to focus a little bit more oriental energy. Here. Do you see that? Uh, no, that's a little too far. Let's make it come back, shall we? Huh? And let's make it move forward. Ah. Ah. <laughs> I'm not going to explain that one. Now, those transitions were very exciting, and it concerned spinning from one direction to the other direction. Something changed. And I suggested that it's a bit like a toy model of phase transition. But that involved increasing the number of particles or you know, changing the conditions from the outside. I now would like to present to you another, and in some sense, more challenging example of a transition where well, there is no such change. The objects themselves start sort of seem to behave really in a strange fashion, depending on some hidden cause. Okay. Those 
heptagon, seven gons, were manufactured by Andy Ruina, a friend of mine at Cornell University, and were sent to me as a present many years ago. And they look really the same. I'd like to guarantee that they are made of the same material, exactly the same material, and they have the same surface coating, they have the same weight, and also something a little subtle but very important, the distribution of mass within each is completely uniform. In other words, I'm not hiding anything. It's not that there's, a, in fact, a cavity hidden inside or there's more mass you know, concentrated around the spoke here than here and so forth. What you see as distributed in volume is exactly how the mass is distributed. Okay, there's nothing hidden there, just the uniform distribution. However, when I try to roll one of them, it rolls quite nicely even with alacrity, but the other one, if I try to roll, it refuses to roll, and then immediately falls down. That's really strange. They look the same, and yet they behave differently. What's different about, about between them? Well, you might imagine lots of answers, but you should also convince yourself, once you imagine something, that that difference is surely really tiny. You can't see the difference. And how come that such a tiny difference causes such a dramatic difference in the behavior? That is really curious. It so happens that those two heptagons are not actually heptagons. What is different among them, between them, is that the one which rolls is a heptagon, but whose sides have been slightly rounded outward, yeah, so as to make it slightly more convex, as we say in mathematics, so a little round. Whereas the one that refuses to roll is a straight heptagon. What is the difference? The difference is that when you take the slightly rounded one, you see as the whole thing tries to rotate, the point of contact can pass from one corner of the heptagon to the next corner of the heptagon by moving continuously along the edge. You see there's a, always a contact and there's a continuous motion there to the next one. In contrast, when you take the other heptagon, an honest heptagon, when the, that rounding that I denoted by epsilon becomes actually zero, you see as the heptagon tries to roll, the point of contact is always at one corner, and it cannot move because the entire next edge is in levitation. It's floating in thin air, and it's just tilting, 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 and nothing is in contact with the floor until, bang, it comes the next point of contact, the corner comes into contact, and wastes the entire energy, and motion dies. So that dramatic difference, which causes the discontinuous passage in the case the rounding is zero, is not present when the rounding is non-zero. It doesn't matter how small epsilon is, theoretically. However small, epsilon can be 0.01. It rolls nicely and smoothly. 0.00001, it still rolls smoothly. 0.00000001, it still rolls smoothly and so forth. So you are tempted to think that, well, when you take epsilon to zero, it should roll smoothly, but that's not true. At that point, the prediction of the theory and the model behavior completely changes. Dramatic and qualitative change. So here we have an example of one of the greatest challenges of mathematical sciences called singular perturbation. You see, when you have a model of any kind, you can think about theory, it always contains some so-called parameters. In this case, it's a rounded, roundedness, epsilon. And you would like the theory or the model to behave in a continuous fashion. Because after all, when you measure this parameter experimentally, there are always errors, right? So a little difference of 0 0.1, 0 0.001, 0 0.00001, and so forth, shouldn't make such a dramatic difference in the prediction of theory. And if it does, the theory is basically unusable. But here is a really simple example where that situation is unavoidable. Probably the most popular example in the mathematical sciences is called Navier-Stokes equation for viscous fluid, where the viscosity, as it goes down to zero, gives you a result which has nothing to do with the case when the viscosity is zero. It's supposed to be a great challenge, but that challenge is an infinite dimensional challenge. But here, it's a very, very small example, and it's a toy of everyday life. And yet, we encounter this great um, challenge. Speaking of 
the heptagon, that was a seven gon, I'd like to insert a little um, comic relief by showing the following trick. You know, um, maybe you learned in geometry in high school or university how to draw a regular polygon. For example, how do you draw with a ruler and compass a regular triangle? Well, that's a collateral triangle. That's quite interesting. How do you draw a square? How do you draw a pentagon? Can you draw every regular polygon? And so forth. Now, those constructions with rule and compass tend to be quite complicated if ingenious and pleasing. I'd like to show you a really nice and stupid way of constructing a regular polygon. Stupid in the sense that I don't have to do anything. Nature does it for me. What you do is you take a strip of paper, and then you tie it into the simplest knot that you can imagine. Yeah, simple knot like this. OK? Once I have tied the knot, I try to flatten the knot while making it tighter. Flatten and make it tighter. Flatten and make it tighter. And I keep doing flattening and making tighter. And at the end, when the knot is completely flat, I obtain this kind of thing. Now, in order to show you what's going on, I'm going to tuck in the stuff that's sticking out so that you see only the central part of this picture. And when I tuck in the end, end that's sticking out, what you see in the middle is a regular pentagon. Completely automatic. I didn't have to do anything. By the way, if you happen to have visited Japan and stayed at the traditional inn, they give you, lend you for the evening, a pyjama, very nice kimono, with a belt, cloth belt. And they usually fold the cloth belt in a pentagonal shape like this by folding it like that. So it is a really nice way to construct a regular pentagon. Now, you might have also learned that in advanced mathematics, you can show, you can prove that not all regular polygons are constructible with rule and compass. For example, the 11 gon, regular 11 gon, cannot be constructed by rule and compass. But by the same method, I folded the 11 gon <laughs> on a long uh, plane journey, and here it is. You see, in the previous case, I made a simple knot. I made one pass and then tightened the knot. Here, if you make two passes, instead of a pentagon, five gone, you get a seven gone. If you make three passes, you get the nine gone. And if you make another pass, you get the 11 gone. So by making enough passes, you have to do it in a systematic fashion and tightening the knot. You can make any regular polygon. You are thinking, ah, but wait a minute. What if the number is even? Well, once you know all the odds, the dividing each angle into two is very easy, so you can reach all the even ones as well. So the picture is that that's how you fold. With one pass, you have n equals 5, regular pentagon. With two passes, n equals 7. Well, some people are whispering, well, what about regular 3 gone then? It's an odd number, but we can't get there because, you know, already with one pass, I'm at 5. Well, if you want to go to three, surely you have to do zero pass. And the way to make a knot with zero pass is like this. You just fold it back and then arrange the corners, and that's going to give you a regular three gone. OK. That was the little digression. Let's go back to those strange behaviors of everyday objects, and especially singular behaviors. Every once in a while, you run into a person who happens to be carrying around an inclined plane. <laughs> and here, I brought um, a number of jars. This jar is full of nice um, basmati rice from India. And this jar is full of nice air from Minneapolis. So full and empty. Let's call them one and zero, the fraction of the rice inside. And I propose to let them roll down the slope. This rolls down quite fast. Oops, sorry. This goes down quite fast. So we can say they roll down more or less at the same rate. OK, OK, the moment of inertia is doing something. Not exactly the same rate, but to a good um, rough approximation, they roll down at the same rate quite fast and rather briskly. So what I would like to do then is to study, investigate, what happens if I change the amount of rice inside. Instead of making it full or empty, what if 
I make it half full, half empty. Or in order to make the contrast more interesting, I brought here a jar which is two thirds full or one third empty, depending on your optimism, or one third full or two thirds empty. Okay? Now, let's take the two thirds full one. And I shall roll it down the slope. The question is, will it roll down faster or slower, or maybe at the same speed as those zero and one case? Well, there are three possibilities, right? Who thinks the two thirds one, this one, will roll down faster than those uh, previous cases? Faster, school of faster. Who thinks it will go down slower? That's the option that most reasonable people go for, and uh, congratulations. And who thinks that, you, if you remember that story of Galileo dropping two unequal masses from the Tower of Pisa and they landed at the same time, who thinks that the rate of descent will be the same independently of the amount of rise and it will go down at the same rate as before? That's also quite nice and it's a very symmetric answer. So let's try to um, experiment. This is a 2001. Are you ready? I'm going to let it roll down. And it rolls down rather more slowly than this kind of thing. Very slow. That is interesting, but not only is it slow, there's something interesting happening. Maybe it is too far from my microphone, so I'm going to let you hear. While it's going down, it's making a certain noise. It's making a certain noise. <laughs> Can you hear the noise? Did you hear the noise? There's some sort of noise that's ma being made by the rice. No, I can't put it put the microphone back. Okay. Okay, so we shall come back to that noise in a moment. But in the meantime, let's go back to our experiment, continue our experiment, and try the one third case. Yeah. Now there are four possibilities under there. So maybe the one third case is the champion and it's faster than all of the above. Or one third case is the slowest among all those. Or maybe, if you have a um, reasonable mind, maybe it would be faster than the two-thirds one, which was, after all, very slow. Two, faster than two-thirds, but slower than zero or one. Or if you have a beautifully symmetric mind, you might think, oh, there's something symmetric about you know, f and one minus f, if you see what I mean, yeah? f being the filling ratio. So maybe one-third and two-thirds will be the same. One quarter and three quarters were the same. So maybe one third will go down at the same rate as two thirds. So who thinks the one third will go down the fastest? That's very brave and adventurous souls. Um, who thinks it will go down the slowest? Who thinks it will go down at the same rate roughly as two thirds? That's the one that most reasonable people go for, but I see that the, this evening there aren't so many reasonable people. And who thinks that um, it will be faster than the two-thirds, but slower than one and zero. That's also quite reasonable. Okay, so the cameraman is saying that's, uh, that's about it. So let's try the experiment with one-third now. Nothing up this sleeve and nothing up this sleeve. Are you ready? We shall do this. I think this is a bit, uh, this table is tilted. Let's turn it around. I think it's tilted. Oh, what's this? Just one second. Let me give a shake. I, I, don't, I don't like this, actually. So then I, it's interesting. I think the gravity acts differently in Minnesota from the rest of the world. Uh, that's not the one-third one. Oh, that's not the one-third one. Thank you, very, thank you very much. It's not the one-third one. So the one-third one is this one. So the gravity does act the same way in Minnesota. And in case you're filming, I should scratch that comment. And uh, so let's turn it around like this. The one third one, thank you very much. Who said it's not about it? Thank you very much. You should, uh, you should collaborate with me. So are you ready? So I'm going to release it. And it stops completely dead. That's really strange, no? And it's, it stops so completely that even if I encourage it, it really doesn't want to roll. So, if you imagine plotting the graph of the rate of descent as a function of against how much rice there is, there's a whole basin of total stoppage. Let's try to understand why 
the two-thirds one got slowed down, and why the one-third one got immobilized. The secret has to do with when you used to go to beaches and then made sand piles. Did you do that? I did. For any kind of grain, rice, sand, flour, whatever, there is something called an angle of repose. And that is the angle, which I denoted by alpha, the green thing in the corner, of the maximal steepness. In other words, if you try to make the pile steeper than that, the pile starts landsliding, collapses, and then settles at that angle. The experts in granular dynamics among you might know that there are two angles, angle at which the avalanche starts and the angle which at which the avalanche stops. But for our purposes, that's irrelevant. So we are going to say about, talk about one angle. So that's the angle of repose. Yeah? That's the critical angle. And you should remind yourselves that if you are talking about not grains, but some liquid, well, static liquid cannot sustain any angle. If you put the pile of honey, it might look like a pile, but if you wait long enough, it will go into flat mode. So the angle of repose is alpha is zero. Now, let's look at what happens if you have a jar with, which is almost full. That's the first picture. You can see in that picture, can you see that the center of gravity then is almost in the middle of the jar? And that's denoted by the green point, And the gravity is pulling down. On the other hand, where is the point of contact, contact point between the jar and the slope? That's the red point. And you can see that the red point is to the left or on the uphill side of the green arrow. That means, doesn't it, that the, when the arrow pulls down, that's the gravity pulling down, the effect of the gravity is to roll the whole thing downhill in the clockwise direction in the blue arrow. Contrast that in, with a case when there aren't so many grains inside. Then you can create a situation where the center of gravity is to the uphill side of the point of contact, as shown. So that although the gravity is pulling down, its effect, we call it a torque, is to roll the whole body uphill, although the gravity is pulling down, thereby checking the descent. And that is the difference. Note that this can happen only if the alpha, the angle of repose, is greater than the beta, which is the slope of this, um, this device. So for a static liquid, it doesn't work because alpha is always 0. By the way, with honey, static liquid, it's still quite interesting to try because, you know, I use something much, much um, more viscous, for example, something like corn syrup and so on. And if I do the same experiment, it doesn't seem to move. It doesn't seem to move. So I watch, it's still not moving. So I get bored and leave the room and come back 30 minutes later and it's moved a little bit. It's very strange. So it's uh, sort of moving very, very slowly and not in a continuous fashion, it turns out. And this um, strange behavior is not fully understood by the experts. It actually goes into a jerky motion. It sort of gradually creeps and then goes stonk and then gradually creeps and goes stonk and so on. Anyway, you can make a clock out of it to measure the time to go from top to bottom and so on. Okay. So that's what it is. And the, if you draw the cartoon graph, as I was trying to imagine, of the descent pace against how full it is, it looks like this. You see, at 0% and 100%, I call them 0 and 1 earlier on, it's quite fast. So I have those data points up there. But in the middle, there's a whole region of immobility. And what is quite interesting, did you hear the noise, is that when you are nearer the full version, so this is on the right-hand side of that basin of immobility, the grains avalanche inside the jar. So you see, they stick along the wall of the cylinder, and when they emerge on the free surface on the top, they sort of landslide and make that noise and dissipate a lot of energy and so on. That's why it goes down slowly. And it is behaving, in a nutshell, like what we call viscous fluids, fluids that are real, that have some internal friction and so forth. In contrast, let's see what happens if we go to the left of that basin of immobility. After all, when we start emptying the jar, the jar should start rolling again. Because when it's zero, of course it rolls. So it should start rolling before we reach zero. Let's do the experiment. And now I should bring out that other jar. Excuse me. This is very, very close to zero. There isn't uh, much inside. And when I roll it, indeed it moves. But you should see how it rolls. It rolls in a very strange fashion. And now, let me actually zoom a little bit and see if you can. It rolls. I don't know if you can see it. Maybe it's too, too tricky. It rolls in a 
sort of jerky motion, tuck, 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 tuck. And what happens is that instead of having this avalanche behavior, land, landslide behavior inside, the entire body collection of the grains stick together like a single rigid body and slide back and forth in a jerky motion. And then everything goes down. In other words, in the professional jargon, the grains are behaving like an inviscid fluid. In other words, a fluid, liquid if you like, which has no stickiness. Mathematicians have known for a long time, since the 19th century, that the theory of inviscid fluids, very well developed, theory of viscous fluids, very well developed, are totally incompatible. It is a case of what we call singular perturbation. If you try to go from one to the other by taking the limit of the viscous viscosity going to zero, you are in a total mess. But this is probably one of the first examples where, in a natural physical context, you can find two such behaviors that are mathematically, theoretically, and scientifically completely incompatible, but in a single phenomenon. So what we are doing, and this is a collaboration with Nicolas Taberlet in, um, in Ecole Normale Supérieure of Lyon in France, we would like to sort of devise experiments where that basin of immobility in the middle becomes narrower and narrower and narrower. And those two regimes that are inc theoretically incompatible must eventually meet. And then Mother Nature will have some really tough decision to make. Okay. And so we'd like to see that. Now, that was the singular limit, but more like the, you know, the transition between viscous fluid and inviscid fluid. I'd like to present to you another singularity, which is this strange creature. Can you turn around? It is um, a Japanese toy. It's a paper balloon. There's a hole there. And you blow into the hole, and then make it round, and then you play. And you no notice that I'm not going to capture it in camera. Can you see, everyone, from the back, what I'm doing? So it bounce, it's quite bouncy, and you can play with it. Now, that's all well. But when you store it, you crumple it. And the traditional method for making it inflate is to blow through the hole. But there's another interesting method. You see, I crumpled it completely. And let me start tapping it at random. And please be a little patient for a while. Now, if you tap on something, if you strike something, don't you think that you should make that thing smaller and smaller, and you should dent it, and you should make it less and less round, and you should make it less and less convex? Huh? You are denting it, right? So it should become less spherical. But look what's happening. I'm tapping it, strike it in random fashion, and at the end, after all that, what I get is a completely round sphere. So that's a way of making something round by trying to dent it. That's really strange, no? Huh? Now, we are doing an experiment at Harvard where we do this in vacuum. And also, we'd like to do it with very fast tapping or slow tapping and so forth, various uh, you know, variations and so on. But I can make something round by hitting it. <laughs> OK. How does this work? Well, it's not known. But I think one thing that is clear is the following mechanism. So I understand it a little bit, but because we started looking at this and discovered this phenomenon only recently, we don't know quite well. Uh, excuse me, can you switch back a little bit? So the key is the following. When I crumple it, and when I let go, watch what happens. You see, the balloon starts fighting back a little bit. Did you see? It expands a little bit, but it doesn't come back all the way. So it's not like a rubber, which remembers what it used to be and comes all the way back to its original shape, but it does fight back a little bit. Okay. So as it relaxes, it recovers some of its original shape. It uncrumples spontaneously slightly. So what happens is as follows. Imagine that you have this um, paper balloon, which is crumpled on both sides, on the left and on the right, quite crumpled. And I hit it from the left, bang. What happens is that the side that I hit, I over crumple, because I've just hit it. But the other side, by recoil, gets boom, puffed out. 
So the right hand side gets smoother, whereas the left hand side that I hit gets wrinklier. But you see, when something gets, when paper gets over wrinkled, you saw what happened, right? It relaxes back a little bit. So while it's waiting for the next hit to arrive, it relaxes back. Whoop. So that in each cycle, what you have done is that the left hand side has recovered the original wrinkliness, whereas the right hand side became a little smoother. So per each cycle of hitting, I increase the overall smoothness of the whole thing. And then I keep doing it in all random directions. So if I plot the evolution of the volume of the ball, how spherical it's going to be against time, each time I hit, at the moment of hit, I decrease the volume suddenly, but then there's a slow recovery. By slow, I mean it's a split second. And then hit and recover, hit and recover, and then you eventually come towards closer and closer to the, to the spherical shape. What is happening here is quite remarkable because you see this wrinkly object, that's the paper balloon, has the property that you see it's um, an object that has many, many different scales living together. What do I mean by scale? You see there are wrinkles that are very short and fine, and there are wrinkles that are very long and coarse. And in the beginning, when it's all crumply, it's mostly inhabited by short and fine wrinkles. But at the end, it has lots of long and coarse wrinkles, and most of the short wrinkles have been smoothed out. There are many situations in nature and mathematical sciences where lots of different scales come together. The most famous example, and probably the prototype, is called the turbulence, when the fluid flow gets really messy. There, the turbulence is a huge mixture of a mess of vortices or swirls of different sizes. And it turns out that large swirls, large vortices, give some energy to the medium vortices. Medium vortices give some of the energy to the smaller vortices and so on. There is what is called a cascading of energy from the large scale to the small scale. And that is a very typical situation. In fact, that is practically the only natural situation that has been found in nature so far. Some people in the audience who might be experts in fluid mechanics might say, oh no, in two-dimensional turbulence, the cascade is the other way around. But that's a mathematically interesting but rather um, artificial example, so we shall put it aside. So in all physical examples that uh, have been known, the cascade is from large scale to small scale. But here you see, with the wrinkles, what you see is that in the beginning there are tiny, tiny wrinkles, and later on there are larger and larger wrinkles. So the energy is going from the small to the large. That is the inverse cascading. And as I mentioned, there are not so many examples of natural inverse cascading that have been found in nature, and this is one of the really nice examples to study. How nature actually stands on its on her head and flows the energy towards the top, not towards the bottom. Okay, that's the inverse cascading, but finally, can we create a crisis situation within the same body with no change of number of particles, no change of parameter, no change of shape, and no change of anything? The problem is if you have a single body which is minding its own business, can something come to a total catastrophe? And that is the, this example. You know, when you have, does somebody have a coin? I should have brought some money. Um, do you have a coin? Thank you very much. Thank you. So when, uh, when you drop a coin, you hear this characteristic shuddering noise. Did you hear that? It's so characteristic that when you hear noise, this noise in a cafe or bar or restaurant, you know, ah, somebody dropped a coin, right? Thank you very much. So <laughs> this is a very heavy coin, an exaggerated coin, and it's so heavy. Thank you, that I'm going to let you weigh it. Is it heavy? Yeah. Thank you very much, it's very heavy. I should buy you coffee afterwards. And so it's a very, very heavy coin. And because it's heavy, when I launch it, you see a lot of details that escape our attention otherwise. And you see something that is extraordinary. It's being driven by nothing. It's a pure inertial motion, it's going on its own. I'm not driving it by a machine, or the motor, there's no magnet anywhere, it's just minding its own business. Now, 
I'm going to let you listen to the noise that it's making. It's lasting longer than I thought, but it will eventually come to a stop. And when it does, I invite you to watch and listen. So the noise seems to have, at the end, seemed to be going up and up and up, up and then went through the roof, diverged to infinity. That is really extraordinary. Now, this um, object became a great, uh, caused a great deal of controversy about 12 years ago, 12, 13 years ago, and lots and lots of people studied this. I was a postdoc in Montreal, and um, I already figured out a simple model for this. And there was a paper that was published in a really distinguished journal which claimed that this problem could be understood in terms of the friction of the air trapped underneath the disk. Now, lots of people didn't like this um, paper, although it, it was a, an eminent paper. And there was a team, I think, writing in from California in particular, who said that they did the same experiment in the vacuum chamber and they saw the same phenomenon. So it cannot be the friction of the air. Well, in response, you see friction of the air viscosity actually doesn't drop even if you start empty in the air. It's almost constant all the way down to zero density and then it drops for a certain number of reasons because the increase in mean free path compensates for the decrease of the viscosity and so forth. So it's a very, very complicated problem. In the meantime, in Montreal, I thought I was understanding the theory, but I wanted to do a vacuum chamber experiment. But you know how expensive a vacuum chamber is? I mean, you can't afford to do, buy it in your kitchen. So instead of a vacuum chamber experiment, I went to a lady's accessory shop and bought this. It's a plastic bracelet. Now I'm going to spin it, and there is no question here of the air trapped underneath the disk because there is no disk, <laughs> it's empty. Now I'll spin it, and I'll spin it in a nice way. It's like a ballerina standing and dancing and spinning, but she'll soon become tired. It's the, what you can call the first phase of the motion. She's standing up straight, but soon she'll become tired and transit to the next phase, you'll watch. It's going to be very, very soon. Now, you see, it's a different kind of motion. And from that point onwards, it's exactly the same motion as that of the disk of the coin. So it has nothing to do with the air trap underneath the disk. By the way, in order to do science, you have to be a little brave sometimes. You know, when I went to buy this in an accessory shop, I started spinning one bracelet after another, you know, to see which one worked best. And a very, very charming shopping assistant came over and said, may I help you, sir? Yes, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and once you notice this, it becomes an obsession because with everything that you find, you know, you start doing this and uh, it's really uh, embarrassing. Okay, so <laughs> what happens? I'd like to understand what's, what is happening. It has nothing to do with the air underneath the disk. So what is going on? Well, it turns out that the answer is really surprising. Let's understand this motion of a disk in two parts. One of them is that the whole thing is rotating or spinning very slowly. That's fine. But the, it wasn't the spin rate that was diverging that was going to infinity, that was going faster, something else. And that something else was the flapping motion of the whole disk. So we're going to decompose, write separately, the spin and the flapping, and we shall focus our attention on the flapping. And a good way to understand what the flapping does is this classic experiment, I think it goes back to Leonardo da Vinci, although I could never find the literature, of dropping a Super Bowl, and it goes boom, 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 boom. It bounces theoretically infinitely often, but comes to a stop in finite time. Beautiful example of a converging geometric series if you're learning mathematics, by the way. So we're going to draw the analogy between this bouncing motion and the flapping motion. Now, as for the bouncing motion, please um, bear with us. 
if your mathematics hasn't advanced to this level yet, but it's a very, very beautiful thing. So the energy of something has to do with the height of that something. So it's proportional to height. At the same time, you learn that if you drop something from a certain height, you know, the time that it takes squared equals the height. Yeah. Height increases like the square of the time, so it's proportional to time. But time is one over the frequency. How many times per second does something hit per second? So it's one over, one over time. So bounce frequency is to the power two of the, uh, behaves like the energy. Okay. At the same time, this motion comes to a stop. In the beginning, there's a lot of energy going on. At the end, nothing is moving. So energy must have gone somewhere. Where did the energy go? Well, it didn't go to the friction of the air trapped underneath this, as we said. So I'd like to understand before I explain this formula where the energy went. Here is, I think, where the energy is going. You see, as the thing rolls, 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 the point of contact is going around in a circle. But that point of contact is also the point of pressure. That means that point of pressure is cycling, 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 and that does so, it makes the entire support vibrate, which means that it's sending out, if you like, an earthquake wave. Exactly, because I'm just forcing the support to vibrate. And that earthquake wave is carrying off energy and it's not coming back. And that is the main cause of the loss of energy. And in order to convince you of this, let's repeat the same experiment that we did before, but on a good absorber of elastic waves, such as a human body. You know that the human body, especially mine, has been designed to withstand all sorts of shocks. And watch how long the experiment lasts if I do it on my hand. Ready? That's it. The entire energy escaped through my arm to the earth. Effectively, I earthed the experiment. So that is where the energy is going. And if we now look at the um, dissipation of energy, how fast it's being dissipated, well, in the first term, I'm writing the time change of the energy. And instead of measuring the time itself, I'm going to measure remaining time to the singularity when the noise goes up to infinity, goes through the roof. And I denote it by T sing, because sing as in singularity, but also it's the time when the disk sings, you see. So T sing minus T. And when I look at this, I'm going to introduce a hypothesis that it has to do with a flapping frequency. In other words, if it flaps a lot per second, it's going to dissipate more energy. It's not a completely obvious hypothesis, and it can be um, justified if you are thinking about friction and some earthquake, but it is a key hypothesis in the model. Let's see whether it's justified. In the meantime, taking it on trust, we shall say that, well, frequency upstairs and frequency downstairs is the same frequency, and then you can relate how the energy is behaving, and it's something called differential equations, which you learn to solve in the first years of college, and the re solution is very simple. The energy raised to the power three halves behaves like the remaining time, but we know at the same time how the energy is related to the frequency. You see energy is essentially equal to bounce frequency to the negative second power, so you plug it in, we reach the conclusion that the frequency, and now I'm identifying the frequency of the bounce and flap with the frequency of the sound that you are hearing, behaves like the remaining time raised to the power minus one third. That is a very interesting thing. So if the remaining time becomes shorter and shorter, you get effectively one over some small number. In other words, a larger and larger number, frequency goes up, and the sound seems to go through the roof. Ariel Amir of Harvard University recorded the experiment and produced for me, very kindly, the following experimental data. You see the blue squiggles is the sound recording. And it's a log log plot. Time is measured from right to left because I think in Hebrew, which is his native language, you write from right to left. But anyway, so it goes this way. Frequency is up. And you can see the red line, which is a theoretical prediction. And look, it goes straight through the data point. Nowadays, you don't see such clean data in an experiment. It's fantastic. It's uh, almost unbelievable. Somebody must have cheated, you would think, except that Amir and, and uh, Ariel and I are both very honest people. So frequency does diverge like negative one third, and this is a really interesting example of a scaling law in physics. So you can understand now how this object behaves and how 
this uh, divergence occurs. Now, that's the case of the disk. I'm going to precipitate the end a little bit by cheating. And this negative one-third divergence, or the sing finite time singularity, tends, ha happens to be quite universal. Here's another example. I brought here two very strong magnets made of, made of neodymium, one of the most magnetizable elements in the universe. And they are so strong that when I release them, they do this. Yeah. I can throw them in the air and listen to what happens. Can you hear? And you can record this. And again, it's negative one third. It's a very robust and very universal law that we have just discovered with you. OK. So we have been seeing that all those toys have been opening up quite a rich universe ecology of phenomena. And you recognize some of those um, titles that we have been visiting via toys of everyday life chiming teacup to swinging rim, and they open up those wonderful and very challenging themes in today's research. And more. Well, today's research, you know, so far I have been sort of playing with you, but I now would like to, I know that there are some colleagues in the audience, but I would like to address myself in particular to the general public. We all have the image, image of a scientist as perhaps some, you know, old male with a Magnificent, magnificent white beard in a lab coat, you know, sitting in front of a huge supercomputer or in a, an expensive laboratory and so forth. And all these things are, of course, partly true. And labs and institutes and internet and libraries and classrooms and big research grants and all those research proposals and so on, these are supremely important mainstream activity of science. Yeah? That's where we expect science to come from. So you can ask me, and ask yourselves, why, in particular, are we playing with toys? By way of answering this, I'd like to tell you an anecdote. This is taken from Aristotle, a relatively little-known work of Aristotle called, Aristotle called De Partibus Animalium. It talks about a certain pre-Socratic, that is, you know, before Socrates, philosopher, natural philosopher called Heraclitus. I don't know if you have heard of him. He flourished around 600 BC, and he was a big scientific personality of the time, if you see what I mean. So he was the equivalent of a professor at the University of Minnesota in those days. <laughs> and some people came to visit him, and of course, you know, they expect to find Heraclitus in a magnificent robe or lecturing to a big theater or you know, doing a very complicated experiment with expensive machines and so on. And the story is about that visit. Aristotle says, in all natural phenomena, there is something of the marvelous. There is a story that some visitors once wished to meet Heraclitus. And when they entered and saw him in the kitchen, warming himself at the stove and playing with the children, they were surprised and they hesitated. But Heraclitus said, come in, don't be afraid. There are gods even here. Enai gar kai entausa theus. It has been a great pleasure and privilege to have some time with you this evening. So thank you very much for your friendly company, and especially to the director of the Institute of, Advanced, uh, Institute of Mathematics and its Applications, Fadil Santosa, for his kind hospitality. I would like to say thank you. I'm sure Professor uh, Tokieda would be uh, happy to entertain a question or two from the audience. Anyone? Oh, they don't, they don't hear me. Sorry. Okay, if you have any questions, please uh, raise your hand. Would oh, you like to take a question it? here?
The question from the audience is, can you switch back? Does this uh, experiment I have shown you uh, work only on this kind of special device? In, you, have, you have seen very correctly that it's slightly concave. Now, that's in order just to force the object to roll in the center. It has no interest in physics. In fact, you can do it on any surface. It works. But it's designed so that the motion lasts a long time because this elastic vibration and so forth and bouncing off from the reflecting from the rim um, is feeding the energy back and not losing it so quickly. But this phenomenon, as I say, lasts all over the place. Uh, you know, happens all over the place. On your breakfast table, at the restaurant, and everywhere, you see exactly the same thing. And that is what's so charming about this. It's a universal phenomenon and it's divergence to the power negative one third. Thank you for the question. Anything else? Ah, ah, yes. So the question is, what is the name of this paper balloon? Well, in Japanese, and I think that's the best way to Google it, it's called Kamifusen. Let me spell that in English, in the Roman alphabet. It would be spelled K-A, M I F U S E N K A M I F U S E N and kami is means paper. You have heard of origami, that's folding paper. So gami and kami are the same. And fusen means simply paper, um, balloon. But it actually means wind ship, which is an interesting thing for balloon. So kamifusen. And if you Google kamifusen, you will find this. It has to be made with fairly wrinkly and sort of a thin but sort of a sturdy paper. So if you try to make it with ordinary, say, printer's paper and so on, it's not quite, it's too thick, and it's, um, but with sufficiently thin paper, you'll succeed. And it's treated with, I think, with oil and so forth in order to make it unbreakable. of the Pentagon, and the question is, can I repeat the folding of the? Ah, 11 gon, that, that large one. So, so the question is, when I was folding the Pentagon, uh, sorry, Pentagon or this uh, 11 gon, how much time, what? Can I make what? Perfect circle. Ah, so the question is, I can make an 11 gon, 13 gon, in fact, 12 gon, 13 gon, 14 gon, and so on. Can you make a circle out of origami? That's an interesting question. You know, the Greeks, ancient Greeks, bequeathed us a number of famous unsolved problems. One, and you probably have read about this in popular magazines and so on, one of them is called um, trisection of an angle. If you, give, if you give yourself an arbitrary angle, can you, with ruler and compass alone, divide it into three exactly equal parts? Another one is called squaring a circle. That is, can you find, given a square, can you find, draw a circle with exactly the same area? And that's related to your, your, your question. And the third one is um, called the duplication of a cube. If you have a cube, can you make another cube which has exactly twice the volume, which has to do with constructing the cubic root of two. Now, it turns out that with the folding paper, you can solve many of those problems that were later proved to be unsolvable. How does that work? Well, because the condition was using ruler and compass. But using origami, folding paper, you can solve many of the problems that you cannot solve otherwise. So you can see origami is a very powerful geometric tool as well as a wonderful, beautiful entertainment and art form. So, in particular, you can not only trisect, divide an arbitrary angle into three equal parts, but an arbitrary angle into any number of equal parts. You can do that very simply in origami. You can also extract not only a cube root of two, but any root of any integer. You can do that in origami. But squaring a circle because the essential number in the circle involved is pi, and that's irrational, even transcendental, so you cannot do this. However, you can make a larger and larger number, you know, larger and larger polygon, regular polygon, which looks more and more uh, approximately like a circle. That you can do, but the perfect circle you cannot do at the moment. 
However, you can make an origami with curved um, rim, a curved fold. So it's an interesting challenge. Maybe I say that you cannot, but I'm not saying that it's impossible. I don't know how to do it yet. But maybe it's possible in the future. I, I don't know yet. Not with the methods that I'm aware of. OK, uh, if there are no more questions, I think we should thank uh, Professor Tokieda again. Thank you very much. For those of you who need a uh, certificate of attendance, uh, you can get it from Catherine there, who is going to be up at the door towards the e exit. <laughs>